Good morning, almost good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to go ahead and call our Climate Action Advisory Committee meeting to order. Thank you all for being here, for making the trip to be with us today. This is our first in-person meeting in what, like three plus years. So wow. um, it feels wonderful and a bit strange at the same time to, to be all here in one room. So thank you to all who are here in person as well as the folks on the screen. Um, Ross had to, to run a, had, had a family issue that he's dealing with, so he will join us as soon as he can. And in the meantime, I will facilitate our meeting until he arrives. So uh, we'll start with a, a round of introductions. I'll start and we'll just go around the room and then we can do the Zoom. Um, so I'm Tanya Nara, Director of Climate Programs for the RCTA. Uh, David Leland, uh, Sonoma. Uh, Jake McKenzie, I think I'm David Rabbit's appointee for this committee. District 2. Bob Conlon, re representing Snow Valley District 1. And I'm Judith Newsna from Katati. Steve Pierce from Spassful. I'm not currently on the committee. He used to be helping out the Climate Action Committee. Uh, Steve Pierce from Spassful. Steve Pierce from Spassful. I can't raise our hand from the phone. Yeah, we might, I don't know why. Yeah, I, yesterday I can hear somebody talking on the Zoom. Are you all still able to hear us? So we're going to do a round of introductions on Zoom. And I'm just going to go through my screen here. So Ty. So actually, oh, should I actually, if I can um, do for members to, okay. for the members that sure. are on Zoom. Sure. Um, there is there is some admin I need to do with um, okay. AB twenty four forty nine yep. exemptions for remote participation. Um, I was informed from Julie Royce, Christopher Peck, and Tyler Sildy that they will be participating remotely under AB twenty four forty four exemptions. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, AB 2449 allows two virtual attendances per calendar year for just cause. The circumstance for today's teleconference participation, excuse me, is illness and, and child care. Um, let's see. Uh, committee, committee members promoting in today, do you have anyone else over the age of 18 mm -hmm. present at your remote location with you? No. 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 All right, and since this yeah. is just cause, we don't need um, committee vote for this. Okay. And then we can continue, we continue on with the introductions? others. Okay. With the introductions for everyone else. All right, hi. Yeah, Ty Benoit from Healdsburg. And Christopher. Christopher Peck from Windsor. Okay. Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Turk from Healdsburg. Okay. Tyler. Tyler Sylvie, uh, Sonoma County District 3. And Peter. Peter Hoberg, Santa Rosa. And Shirley. Shirley Johnson, Runner Park. I'm in Costa Rica right now, so that's why I'm poorly dressed. Wow. All right, Kevin. Yes, Kevin Conway from Santa Rosa. I'm in the car right now, so hopefully I'll, I'll still be able to participate effectively. Um, Adam. Uh, Adam Garcia, data analyst with SCTA RCPA. And Chris Barney. Good morning, Chris Barney, SCTA. All right, and then we have two phone numbers, the 707-658-2847. Hi, I'm Lindry Purcell with FACS, Families Advocating for Chemical and Toxic Safety. Thank you. And uh, 415-637-4248. Hi, that's me, Taryn Obeyed with Protect Wild Petaluma. All right, did I miss anyone? I think. No, I believe we have it all. And then just um, to note that with the Brown Act requirements, I do need to be informed prior to the start of this meeting um, if you'll be participating remotely. So for those who uh, did not inform me, you will be considered members of the public for today. All right. So I think okay. we will um, dive into the next item on our agenda, which is public comment on items that are not on the agenda. So if anyone wishes to um, speak to the committee, yes. Um, do we have a forum? 
Oh, sorry, we do not have a quorum at this point. Is that correct, Drew? I'm confirming Drew that. Drew is right. having the numbers, but yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so public. Yes, Steve. Hi, um, everybody on the committee, I think, received in, in the packet a document that the Sebastopol Climate Action Committee, the funding task force, wrote about funding climate, regional climate action in Sonoma County. This is really looking at the RCPA's effort for gearing up towards a 2024 ballot initiative. And we looked at various funding sources. Staff has also done this. We were trying to find what would be some more equitable, equitable ways of funding beyond just sales taxes. Sales taxes are quite regressive in the Bay Area. Lowest income individuals pay up to three times as much uh, on sales taxes as a percent of their income as high income individuals do. So in looking at these various funding options, um, a parcel tax which matches our existing mosquito abatement tax of $23 raises uh, just over $4 million. Vehicle registration fee that would raise uh, $10 per vehicle. This is done in Marin, failed in 2010 here in the county by 43% of the vote. It, it would raise $4.7 million. A transient occupancy tax, a 1% increase on all of our hotels across the county would raise $6 million. Airport transportation fee would raise over $4 million. A utility user tax would raise also over $4 million. On the, on the airport fee, that's a $7 per passenger fee. Utility users tax, it's a 2% tax just on natural gas. So there's a lot of detail here. I know I'm hoping you all will take a chance to look at the document and I'm not saying it's the be all end all on, on an, analyzing these things. Staff has done this. Part of the thing I'm trying to raise here is how can we find more e equitable ways besides sales tax to fund what we're hoping to do? And there did seem to be some interest in the meeting. Uh, I guess that was Tuesday. Monday. Yeah, or Monday. Uh, some interest in the airport be a kind of you know what can we do there's always support for taxing somebody else and the airport fee did seem to have interest there and also parcel taxes and continuing on to look at the sales tax but we're kind of at the beginning of this effort and I think it will take some concerted effort to find where can we find more equitable ways of funding what we want to do great thank you Jake? Yeah, just a question. Uh, I know some of us, maybe all of us, are serving on the various committees on land and transportation mm -hmm. and other things that have been pulled together. Is it not the purpose of these committees to uh, come up with recommendations then to go to uh, RCPA's yeah. board of directors? Yeah, to... and that is on our, we'll give an update. Yeah, oh, okay. it is on our agenda. Fine. Oh, yeah. I'm, you know, impressed by the homework that's gone into what various tax vehicles would raise, but surely that's the function of what we're supposed to be doing in these committees to debate these various possibilities of rev revenue raising. Yeah, yeah and, and I'm actually up. gonna do a presentation on that okay. on our agenda. I'll be quiet. Maybe I'll have a chance to, to weigh in a bit more on that. No, no, yeah. I... yeah, thank you, Jake. Sam, you we're in public comment right now. Yeah, I know, but I uh, I don't I haven't received the document that's part of the packet. So just, okay, it did go out. I sent, yeah. I sent it out yesterday. Yeah, and it's on the website. Yeah, so it's on the you, website. Yeah, and we can get it to you if you don't have a copy. All right. Great. Thanks. Uh, All right. Do we have any other members of the public who would like to make a comment? Hey, can I um. Sorry, Thank this you. is Stephanie Turk on Zoom. I, I don't, I guess I wasn't clear on the Zooming in participation rule. I do have a minor at home with me, um, but I didn't request in advance. Are, are Ty and I, who are from Healdsburg, are we going to be allowed to communicate in the rest of the meeting or are we just members of the public now? You're members of the public since, since you didn't notify Drew in advance. Okay, uh, so should we give our like, updates now in the members <laughs> of the public section? <laughs> to, to, to comment, but... Um... Yeah, you are members of the public for the purposes of okay. this. Okay. And 
If I may add on yeah. that note, we do not have a quorum for today's meeting, so we won't be able to act on the commit on the meeting notes from July 8th, 2022. But those on the screen can still participate with the yeah. committee as normal yeah. since it's committee of the whole. All right. So public comment. It, can you can it wait, Pete, or do you okay? All right. Yes. So I'm Catherine Dodd. I'm um I feel like I'm here among the real activists, and I'm so glad that there is an action committee attached to one of the Sonoma County boards, because it seems like action doesn't always happen, so it's great to be here with you. Um, I'm here to talk about plastic grass, um, which is probably the largest contributor in terms of our open space to climate uh, of anything. Plastic grass, creates heat islands, uh, it attracts the heat, it holds it, and then it gives it off during the night. It is, in many cases, not permeable. So, so when it does get washed down, which they have to wash it down whenever the, amp, the outside temperature is 75 degrees, um, when it gets washed down, it just creates steam, which further endangers kids. Kids are ha having um, heat-related illnesses. Um, in some states, they reported heat strokes. Um, on plastic grass. It also heats up so much that kids get heat burns when they fall on it. Um, but besides that, besides that individual component, um, it's made of fossil fuel. So the county funds acres and acres and acres of fossil fuel, essentially carpet, that creates heat islands and that's only good for eight to 10 years. So it ends up in our landfill where, where it further off gases and the chemicals leach in. Um, to our groundwater. The chemicals from the, the fields when they're in play leach into our groundwater, and especially when they're uh, sprayed off. Uh, um, Bob is going to talk about a field that's right here, four miles from us, but the idea that we're putting in acres and acres of fossil fuel uh, heat producing uh, ground covering is absolutely crazy. Now, yes, we're in a drought, but but over time, when you look at the costs, if you put in a uh, drought resistant turf, which they've done all over the East Coast, we're a little late to the process, um, that that turf sequesters carbon, um, it's easier to fall and it actually cools the area. So um, it's a penny saved is, um, a penny earned. And uh, I think that it's really, really important that we've just learned in the past eight years that plastic grass is made with a chemical called PFOS. Um, it's a, a call a forever chemical because it takes forever to disintegrate. Um, it, it's a lipophilic chemical uh, as a nurse. It stays in your body and it causes DNA damage. It's associated with immune dysfunction. It's associated with neurological diseases. Um, and it gets into our water. The EPA just issued uh, standards. The deadline for comment is May, uh, May 14th, um, lowering the amount of PFOS we can have in our water because it's so dangerous and because it lasts forever. Um, PFOS, when it rolls off these turf fields and out of our landfill, ends up in wells. Um, so, it's a, it's, so it has dangerous chemicals, it creates heat, and it's dangerous for individual kids playing on it. Uh, and the Board of Supervisors is actually going to be voting on whether or not to approve yet another plastic grass peat island um, right up here in Joplin Field. And we had requested that the Regional Park Department um, not include plastic grass as one of their options or synthetic turf. And they went ahead and did it. In fact, they not only included it, they gave it preference over regular turf. So to have the Sonoma County policy be, we give preference, preference to fossil fuel-based heat, heat island, chemically laden um, plastic uh, over large pieces of turf is just doesn't make sense for a county that's as climate um, sensitive and responsible as this one. So um, I know that it's too late for you to advise the um, climate uh, protection authority. Uh, we, I attended that meeting earlier. Um, but it's and it's even too late for them to take action. But it's not too late for individuals to take action. It's not too late for those of you who represent elected officials to let them know. Um, and and it's not too late to to advise the protection authority for the next time around um, that 
the uh, Sonoma's policy ought to be not to purchase plastic grass. And we can't ban it because in 2008, when Connecticut and Massachusetts banned it, the, the crumb, crumb rubber tire recycling industry got, you know, they were, uh, they lost business. So they came to California and got language amended into a law in 2015 that said, you can't ban plastic grass in California. So all we can do at the local level is not give it preference, is say, um, we really, we shouldn't be using this. And, uh, and I'll point out Windsor as a, um, a bright star, they are ready in their grass for uh, exchange. You, you exchange your, your lawn for um, drought resistant covering. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Windsor, <laughs> you can, uh, Windsor you can already banned it. Uh, yeah. And says we we won't give we won't take that's not a drought resistant um, product. So thank you, Windsor. A state law that's in, in the process was modeled after Windsor's uh, program, um, and we should the entire county of Santa Rosa should do that. So Great. thank you thank very you, much. Kathy. Thank you. Any other members of the public yeah. in the room, and then we'll go to Zoom. Yeah. yeah. My name is Bob Chipola. I'm a resident of Larkfield, uh, directly adjacent to Tom Shoffman Fields Regional Park. And I'm a fire, well, I won't call myself a victim, but in 2017, my house burned. We rebuilt it, my wife and I, and we rebuilt it with the best information we could get as to the future. We uh, built without natural gas. It's all electrified. It's solar powered. It's battery backed up. We share one electric car. So we're doing what we can uh, to, to affect the climate in our own small way. And I'd like to see examples in the, in the government of Sonoma County, the Board of Supervisors in particular, to create a moratorium on plastic grass um, for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the first time I became aware of it was when walking my neighborhood, and I do this often, I pick up litter in a five gallon bucket with a grabber. That's just, you know, I'm advertising for myself a little bit because I'm gonna ask you guys to do stuff as well. You probably already are, but I'm looking for a countywide effort to, have things that are sustainable that we do in our everyday life. Um, specifically, I found out that there's over four acres of plastic grass in Shoffman Fields Regional Park already serving as a soccer field. Uh, in 2015, women were made to play the FIFA uh, uh, games on plastic grass, and they said no more. 2016, no more. Women play like men do on in FIFA uh, matches. So there's a there's a sense of equity in the whole thing. But what we're trying to slow down and even stop is a request for proposal filed by the regional parks uh, requesting more plastic grass fields and other four acres, which would create about 40% coverage of a 21 acre park, if you do the math. And it specifically says synthetic turf. It says the field should be identified and bid for synthetic turf, non synthetic turf may be considered if, and then dot, dot, dot. So now we're calling green growing grass non-synthetic turf. An agency of the Sonoma County Parks or the, of the government is calling it non-synthetic turf. So we got to stop this. And I'm hoping you folks will be interested enough and, and, and Catherine talked about action. Um, we're trying to take action. We hope everybody tries to take action to stop this unsustainable, um, incredible waste at the end of its life. Uh, that we may have thought was a good idea at one time, but we know it's not now. So please take action, recommend to the Board of Supervisors and whatever the other committee is that you're part of, that they halt this until we can study to see if this is really a good idea. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you both for being here. Uh, any other members of the public in the room that wish to speak? If not, yeah. to Zoom. Yes, Tanya, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Kevin, um, actually Carrie had her hand up um, so I'll oh, go to sorry, Carrie first, and then, then, then Kevin, and then Ty. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, so I'm joining the public comment, even though I'm on the CAC, um, but we'll hopefully be there in person next time. Um, and if we can ever get Zoom options back, that would be awesome. Um, I wanted to give an update about the Petaluma Equitable Climate Action Coalition. Um, this was a six and a half month civic engagement program focused on uplifting voices most impacted by climate change in designing solutions to it. And this year we focused on transport equity um, and transit equity 
And we had a really powerful presentation last month. We were grateful that Tanya was able to join um, and a lot of elected officials and community members from Petaluma um, as this youth um, team uh, folks presented recommendations. And I will put the recommendations in the chat. Really wanted to uplift this as a model of equitable civic engagement. All participants received an $1,800 stipend for participation. And it's a model that we really want to uplift, um, centering these voices and having folks committed for their time, leading, listening members of their community size record forwards. I know that I've provided updates on this program already, um, but wanted to let folks know that we have completed it with a powerful set of recommendations that we wanted to share. I also wanted to give an update and um, invitation to everybody to attend uh, the environmental justice program Locian is hosting next Friday at Sally Tomatoes. It is nearly sold out. I think there are five tickets left. Um, so if you would like to come and are able to make it, I wanted to let folks know it's going to be a really powerful event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Kevin. Yes, uh, I echo the words that Carrie said about participating as a member of the public, but I, I did want to point out that I just recently completed the training for the Climate Reality Project. That was my second certification, but uh, that meeting, those meetings really emphasize the importance of the Inflation Reduction Act and the uh, bipartisan in infrastructure law in terms of getting money for lots of projects. There's billions and billions of dollars now available for projects. And when these projects are uh, headed toward uh, members of the community that are uh, not disenfranchised, even better, the, the opportunity to get money for projects like that is very good. So I don't know if it's uh, on the agenda uh, to talk about uh, applying for these grants, but uh, if it isn't, I would sure like uh, to know what the status is in terms of the RCPA and SCTA on applying for grants. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Ty. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm the CAC representative, one of them from Healdsburg. Um, I appreciate the comments, the two public comments about the artificial turf, the plastic. It's um, really a major problem. And so thank you for coming. Thank you, Carrie, for all the good work that you do in Petaluma. You're always a model for the rest of us. <clears throat> but I'd also like to say that Looking at the new rules that are going forward, I want to clarify what Stephanie and I can do today as we don't have a quorum because some of us are not there in person and hope to be there next time. But I do want to point out that if we're trying to have an equitable board, creating this kind of a situation where you can only have two absences, and I know you don't make the law, um, but there must be some way to address this because it makes it really hard on people who have children who are working and unable to get there in person. So I'd just like to register a little bit of concern about that. And if we are going to be thinking about greenhouse gas emissions, is there a way to work around this? Um, so anyway, that's all I have to say. And hopefully, those of us from Healdsburg will be allowed to update what's going on in Healdsburg. Um, so can you clarify that? I know you're not supposed to respond to public comments, but this is this seems like yeah. a bit of a, a strange situation. Yeah. Do you want to take that, Drew? You want me to? Yeah, uh, certainly, Ty and uh, Stephanie, you're more than welcome to give updates from Healdsburg today. That's totally within reason. Um, SCTA staff, we are tracking legislation at the legislature in fixing this, if you will. Um, there are several bills being worked on um, and, we're, and we'll let you know when changes are made or yeah. however. Like we but, submitted a comment letter, right? Or, or yeah, some, we have submitted some. a comment. Um, we did reach out to right. other committees, um, representatives to get what, what their opinion like on it, testimonials or, yeah, the impact to allow remote participation. But we, I completely agree with you and 
you know, it is a barrier, but we're tracking and we will let you know as soon as the legislator makes those changes. Yeah. And and the only um, action on the on today's agenda, which we will not take because uh, we don't have a quorum, is the approval of the minutes. So if we had a quorum in the room here, Ty, you wouldn't be able to vote on approving the minutes. But yeah. other than that, um, yes. Yeah, just a point of clarification. Um, at the moment, our committee is 24 members. We have is, two it a, is it a full committee? We have two vacancies, so it's 22. So that's 22. Yeah, yeah. so we're counting the quorum from 22. So what's the, the quorum 12, number? 12. In the room. In the room. It has to be in the room. Oh, it has to be yeah. in the room. It has, the legislators mandated that the quorum is the people in the room. Okay. Hopefully. Hopefully. Remote, remote location that people are not only to. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 It just has people to be rearranged. Your city hall and yeah, so just, but we have to have that information in advance. Correct? Yeah, that information needs to be advanced and the quorum needs to be in the room. All right. Any other members of the public wishing to make a comment before we move on from this? I am. I'm on the phone. Yes. And who is this? Hi there. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, Taryn Obeyed with Hi, Perfect Tara. Water Luma. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm an analyst and I've spent a major part of my career in risk management. And um, recently I did some analysis on um, forever chemicals and specifically artificial turf. And um, it took me down a rabbit hole that was an absolute horror show. And that's why I'm jumping on the call today to urge you to please consider um, the waste impact and the climate impact of uh, plastic turf that not only are they made with forever chemicals, but they're a heat island. Um, I went out as an analyst and I spoke with soccer players on synthetic turf here in Sonoma County. And uh, these are um, these are serious soccer players that are post-university uh, and they don't like it. They say it looks perfect, it appears perfect, but it does not compare with natural turf, but it's the only choice they have. The best natural turf is what they uh, play on at universities, uh, but we don't seem to have caught up with the best practices for maintaining grass lawns. And I'm sorry if I just mis misspoke. The best grass lawns for soccer fields that they played on are at universities uh, because they've got um, they've kept up with the technology and the innovations for the right varieties of grass that are more drought resistant and are tougher and are easier to maintain. So um, they just say that they're not getting the options for natural grass and they'd like Sonoma County to catch up with it. Um, I would like to ask uh, the committee to please spread the word by connecting with other committee members, uh, with the Board of Supervisors, consider sending a formal letter asking for a resolution by our Board of Supervisors and also with various cities within Sonoma County, the city councils, to do what Milbray, California has done. They passed a moratorium. Sure, uh, we cannot ban the installation of artificial turf according to uh, the legislation that's currently in place, um, do you think to the artificial uh, turf industry, but there are three bills going around in Sacramento right now that are proposed to walk that back. And Milbray has a tactic that's very clever. They've passed a moratorium that they then renew every year and it's keeping synthetic turf out because from a risk management standpoint, this is a huge climate impact beyond what you might be aware of. Not only are these things non-recyclable and they're creating mountain ranges of rolled up disposed plastic turf because it only lasts five to 10 years, um, but also it's the PFAS are contaminating soil and contaminating water supply. Down in Southern California, the Farm Bureau uh, because uh, in the Central Valley and down in Southern California, the agricultural industry is really important, but their wells are getting shut down due to PFAS contamination, and it's impacting their ag industry. We certainly don't want that up here. Our ag industry, we must protect. 
So I'm asking you to please consider doing everything you can possibly imagine to give this legs and walk it back because the lawsuits are coming, not just for the players that are getting sick from this and having injuries from this and heat stroke from this, but from the contamination of soil and water supply. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Oh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, who is this? Are you, are you here to this make is Lind Lindry Pur Yes, I am. Lindry Purcell with Sachs Families Advocating for Chemical and Toxic Safety. I'm also with the fund Jonas Philanthropies. We fund children's environmental health um, research and advocacy around the country. Um, plastic grass, I'm, I'm going to associate myself with the other comments, particularly Catherine Dodd, public health nurse, and the other comments that have been made about plastic grass. I just want to make sure we're, we're, we're really clear. We're not just talking about the tire crumble infill that has traditionally gone under the plastic grass. The environmental health community is sort of caught up to that hazard. There are some solutions, some natural solutions that are being touted, but there are problems with those. As it turns out, those are also um, saturated in chemicals. Uh, we're really talking about the plastic grass that goes above the infill that's, that we're learning is problematic, uh, mainly because of PFOS. There was a recent, um, if you look up Philadelphia Inquirer investigation about Vet Stadium and the six pitchers who, um, six players who died of brain cancer and the PFOS chemicals that were found in the plastic grass field. There is no plastic grass that does not have PFOS. PFOS is needed to keep the little blades from sticking to each other. Um, so it's all contaminated, and I just want us to really think about our children's health, the health of our planet, and um, and I just want to let you know that, that that the solutions aren't aren't hard to come by. There's a, a grant through a group called Beyond Pesticides to a group in Marin. It's a partnership with non-toxic schools. We have an expert coming out um, starting this spring who's going to do free webinars to parks managers and anyone else interested. Uh, Sonoma County is included in this as well as part of the grant if we want to send people for um, ongoing free webinars. And then there will be in-person visits from a group called, um, um, oh my gosh, uh, uh, Osborne Organics that's coming out from the East Coast. We're also building technical assistance here in Sonoma County. Daily Access is looking at this issue. Um, we're going to have we have some landscapers who are getting trained here. So we have the technical assistance to do this. And 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 as has been said before, um, it's cost saving if you look a little bit long term out, not even that far out. Um, given that these things need to be replaced so quickly that, that we can do this in a water-saving way. The, the fields get so hot, the grass, they need to be watered anyway, which is kind of ironic. So using recycled water on really low water grass is the way to go, and there we have the tools and we have the, the skill set to do that. So I hope that you'll look into a moratorium and anything you can do to protect our children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other members of the public wishing to make a comment? Okay, hey, so I'm, yes, Pete. Is that me, public? Uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah. We, we can't have a conversation on this topic as a committee, so I think. Uh, I just wanted to, as hard as it is to, to pull back from a very focused discussion, uh, I, I want to try to do that. Um, and, and I want to say this with, with the utmost respect for all of us who are interested enough in climate issues to be here. But I remember in... 2018, when the IPCC report that was released in that year, we were told that in order to have a two-thirds chance of not exceeding one and a half degrees centigrade of overall temperature rise, we had about 400 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, about 10 years worth of emissions at then current levels that we could safely emit without going over. That was five years ago. Um, all of the jurisdictions in Sonoma County apparently took that, that warning to heart, and we have all adopted the very ambitious goal of carbon neutrality by some definition by 2030. While I appreciate all of the efforts that we're doing, what I mean missing is a plan for how we get from where we are now to zero emissions. Um, and in a way, it feels like just bringing this up is a 
the emperor has been closed because I think we all somehow on some level feel that we are adrift and we don't have a clear plan. Um, I just wanted to bring that out as a matter for us all to consider. Great. Thank you. Okay, with that, I think I'm going to move us, I don't think I will move us to the next item on our agenda. And so as Drew mentioned, we don't have a quorum, so we're not going to cover item three. So we'll be proceeding as a committee of the whole. That's right, right. correct language. Um, so I'm, the next item on our agenda is an update on our climate protection initiative. And so Drew, if you wouldn't mind bringing the slides up, um, I guess I could do it too, let's see. Yeah. Can I? Um, would that be easier? Please. Okay, let me, let me see. <laughs> getting there. Do you have it already? Oh, see, I'm still getting through the folders. You're going to share? Oh, all right. Thank you, Dirk. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, don't end the meeting. <laughs> so I'm going to give a brief. Uh oh. Oh no. Oh no. We were we're fine. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Do you share then? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. All right. We'll stop sharing. <laughs> That's a good trick. Uh -oh. Go host. My computer's starting to make a sound. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Okay. I may need help getting it in the right mode. If I do. All right. Excellent. So. I'm going to give a brief update on the Climate Protection Initiative. So first, in terms of our status. Oh, are you going to advance? Well, I can do it with, my, with this, Richard. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, as hopefully everyone remembers, and actually Jake mentioned, we have our program committee. So there's a committee that's focused on transportation, one on transportation, and one on land and water. And these committees were convened. Um, as part of a, a volunteer uh, overall committee to basically identify a set of projects and programs in each of those areas that could be um, used by our board or uh, recommended to our board for inclusion in a potential climate revenue measure, which we're looking to the ballot in 2024 to uh, basically bring in additional local funding to Sonoma County so that we can fund all of the climate action work that needs to be done to get at Pete's point about there's a whole lot of work that we need to do and we don't in all cases have the resources we need to, to complete that work. And so we are undertaking this uh, effort with um, many members of the community to understand what are our local priorities, where should this money go, um, assuming that we're successful in um, some type of local revenue measure. So our program committee meet program committee started meeting in February um, and have met at least once or twice. Um, and we're gearing up for a public workshop on April 19th, where we plan to share the results so far of the committee's work and give the members of the public an opportunity to give some initial feedback on those uh, project and program ideas. Um, we're then planning to, actually I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we're also planning to table at a number of upcoming events to again, get uh, give the public an opportunity to hear what we're working on and to provide inputs on that. And then lastly, recognizing the importance of integrating equity and environmental justice into everything we do. We've been working to bring on a, a group of environmental justice advisors. Um, and we are right now looking at working with several CBOs, community-based organizations, 
to advise our program committees and our CPA staff on ways to increase engagement with, for example, our Latinx community, our low income community members. Um, so really working closely with those community based organizations to help um, organize additional community outreach events advise the program committees as they're putting their project list together and really partner closely with us to uh, make sure that we're integrating environmental justice into everything that we do. Um, let's see. In terms of other milestones, so today we're uh, meeting with all of you to present our funding options. Um, we have the workshop that I mentioned, and then at our May 8th RCPA board meeting, we plan to bring to the board, the inputs that we hear from the community at next week's meeting and a set of uh, draft project lists, as well as um, staff will be bringing a recommendation on a contract with a polling firm, because one of the key first steps in this work that we're doing is to get the pulse of the community in terms of, you know, what, what is the community feeling about investing more money in climate and the, the different types of options that we have to bring in new revenue. So we, we feel that polling step is very important. And we wanna thank and appreciate our partners at the county because they're providing the funding to be able to do this poll as part of the county strategic plan. So um, that's been a great uh, help to us in that. And then at our June 12th board meeting, um, the board will approve the final set of poll questions and that poll will be um, launched for uh, in the June and July timeframe. So looking at the, um, the revenue measure, um, we first wanted to, um, really clarify that when we talk about a revenue measure, we're talking about bringing in additional local money to Sonoma County that can be used to fund climate work versus financing, which uses borrowing mechanisms to advance money that then we have to pay back. Because we've gotten some questions about, well, why don't you, you know, uh, put a bond on the ballot, for example. And so that's really a type of financing that we need to have some sort of revenue to pay back um, the interest on that. And so financing is not bringing new money in, it's just... Um, borrowing to, to get that money in advance. So we've uh, been doing some work with our legal counsel. And as um, some of you may recall, RCPA was designated as a climate resilience district through Senate Bill S SB 852, um, which basically gives us a little bit more authority than we had prior to this bill being enacted. Um, it, it gives us the ability to put measures on the ballot or to, to do, find, to do um, some of these revenue measures that were um, exploring here today. Um, and this chart shows all the different types of revenue that we're looking at. And, and thanks to Steve and the um, Sebastopol group, we're definitely taking into consideration the, the inputs that they put together as well. Uh, but we wanted to show here which of these options our CPA has the authority to pursue, um, as well as which of these options could be applied countywide because we're really trying to bring in a lot of money that can be used across the community versus some of the options here, say for example, um, developer fees are certainly something that an individual jurisdiction could choose to put forward, but it's not something that would be um, countywide unless all jurisdictions took that same approach. And as you might imagine, that can be somewhat problematic to try and get something passed in every jurisdiction in order for it to be countywide. Um, so the three options that that are in front of us, and actually only two really are for our RCPA um, only, is the parcel tax. Um, and you can see there um, that it could be a flat per parcel um, rate or something that's based on other factors like parcel size. Um, and an example listed there just to give you a sense for how much money could be raised through a parcel tax. Um, there's a sales tax, which um, we, we certainly talked about already. Um, and this is collected you know, based on sales of, of of goods. Um, and there is a cap in place in Sonoma County in terms of how, how high that sales tax could go. And I'll uh, show a chart a little bit later that um, shares the rates per each jurisdiction. So you can see what that looks like. And so an example of that would be our Go Sonoma transportation sales tax measure that was passed a couple of years ago. And that generates about $33 million annually. And then lastly is the vehicle license fee. And actually, RCPA doesn't have the authority to, 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 to put this on the ballot, but SCTA does. So SCTA could put a vehicle license fee on the ballot. In fact, it's been tried in the past and did not pass here in Sonoma County. And there's, there's limitations around what those types of fees could fund and what a vehicle license fee could fund. But that is an option that we also have local control over and could be countywide. So I wanted to share just a couple of slides um, to the 
the point about sales tax and taxes in general being regressive. Um, and this is data from um, an organization called the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. Um, and it just shows what you would expect to see in terms of the percent impact on the different income tiers that, that we have um, as shown here on this slide. So the largest impact on our lowest income earners. Um, and this is data in California. And it's a 2018 study. So the data is a little bit dated, but the patterns um, you can imagine are, are uh, repeating or, or still the same today. And then we have property tax in California. Again, a similar type of pattern, not as great of an impact, uh, but still you see a higher impact at the lower income levels. And then um, the state of California attempts to, in some ways, offset the regressivity of the sales tax and the excise taxes with a much more progressive personal income tax structure. So you can see that our higher wage earners pay you know, significantly higher percentages of their income in uh, personal income taxes. So that offsets to some extent the uh, regressive nature of the other taxes. And then this just gives a picture of putting all of those pieces together. What is the impact across our different um, income brackets? So that's the picture in California. And then looking at Sonoma County data, um, this is the breakdown of um, household income over the last 12 months um, in 2021 inflation adjusted dollars. Um, so you can just see how our local income spreads across the different um, income brackets. And just a note that in the previous slide, um, the top 20, there was about the top 20% of earners in California earned over $100,000. And in um, Sonoma County, it's it's more like 40% are above 100,000. So we have a wealthier population, if you will, than other parts or than California as a whole. Um, so that's the household income levels. And then we just did a simple calculation to try and get at least an initial kind of um, estimate or understanding of what the impact would be of a um, eight cent or a quarter cent or a half cent sales tax. Uh, this would be not the whole, you know, the whole nine or ten percent. With if we did a climate sales tax, but just looking at the sales, the climate piece alone. Um, so you can see if if we make an assumption that thirty percent of an of household income is spent on taxable goods. Again, a very rough assumption. It, I'm sure it varies across the levels, but we didn't have that data. Um, you can see the what the annual cost would be. Um, to someone in each of those income brackets. And then looking more closely at our sales tax data uh, in Sonoma County. So this is sales tax collection by sector in Sonoma County in the third quarter of 2022. And SCTA um, regularly gets this information since we have the transportation sales tax measure. Um, so things to note here is that about 35% of the tax collected is from business to business transactions. Um, and about 5% we're estimating is from tourism. If you look at um, the restaurants, hotels, and make some assumptions about what percentage of that is tourist versus local. Um, and then in the food category, that is, it's not groceries. Groceries aren't taxable in um, California, but that apply, the tax does apply to hot or prepared food. So that's the food percentage that you see there. Um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to point out here. And then lastly, on the tax side, just so you can see what our current um, sales tax rates are by jurisdiction. Yeah, um, so nothing in particular to point out here. You can see that there are a couple of jurisdictions. The, the, the cap in Sonoma County is 10.25%, so we can't go any higher than that. Um, and that's due to this Sonoma County cap of 3% that was added on through legislation, um, and that expires in 2026. So unless that's renewed starting in 2026, if somebody wanted to put a new tax on the ballot, that would ex they, they couldn't do that if it would exceed the, the 10, the, uh, actually it would be 7.25% at that point. Jake, did you look like you have a question? Um, no, I, it was just going back to restaurants and hotels. Mm -hmm. uh, that bar, bar graph um, does that include TOT? I don't know. It's TOT sales is tax, not so I don't. Sales yeah, tax. it wouldn't be part of no, that. It, 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 it wouldn't be right. No, it's an yeah. Um, so that's what I have to share on the funding options. Before I go on to some of the other climate. Protection Initiative updates. Does anyone have any questions on that or comments? 
Just T I D will not tell you the abbreviation. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, thank you for that. And the, the so I understand there's a limit on a sales tax. Are there limits on any of the other tax vehicles that have been explored to date? Are they are there caps associated with any of those other? I don't know. Your question. So that would be a question. I think we we'd like to have the public fully informed about where those caps might be. Um, and then I asked a question at the SCTA RCPA board meeting about the threshold of uh, support that was needed for those various tax vehicles, these mm -hmm. different mechanisms, mm -hmm. and. The answer I got back was that all of them now require a two-thirds level. However, I'm a little confused because some of these things, for example, some of the things that have been suggested by the City of Sebastopol Climate Commission, they indicated that some of those actions could be taken by fiat, by the elected officials. Mm -hmm. Some of the business license fee or uh, airport oh, fee and things yeah. like that so i think it'd be helpful in evaluating these different approaches if that threshold information was also similarly com comparable mm -hmm. and if maybe in the sub the small groups the workshop groups if that could be done before we meet again those groups meet again and certainly before the april 19th uh public workshop be helpful to have that information compiled for us mm -hmm. so those would be my feedback as to where we are at this process right now. So far, we seem to be very focused on sales tax, but I'm having a hard time disaggregating that approach from the other comparable approaches. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, is there another? Yeah, there was. Well, just as a comment, um, I, I saw this presentation on Monday, and in my opinion, I believe that we offer the taxpayer and the voter, but in my opinion, I think that we put the cart before the horse. We're asking for money when the voter at this point, I mean, Petaluma is right up there at the top for mm -hmm. the sales tax. I want to know what I'm paying for. Mm -hmm. If it were, and I was also a parks commissioner for eight years and am very active in our measure M for parks, mm -hmm. it, it passed because people knew exactly what they were paying for. And the same with our library tax. It passed, mm -hmm. it, it exceeded the thresholds because people knew exactly what they were paying for. So I would like to suggest that rather than polling people about their thresholds of paying for these various taxes, that we poll them instead for their climate priorities so that when we do a presentation, we're not asking them, you know, how painful this is, we're saying, how strongly do you believe in this so that then we can present that as our story as to why we need the money rather than yeah. we know you all care about climate yeah. and then climate takes money. Yeah. So that that's takes money. beautifully said. Thank you so much because that's exactly what we're trying to do with the Climate Protection Initiative is to get input and understanding from the community on climate priorities. Where would the community want that money to go? And taking the results from next week's community meeting, as well as all the program committee work, we'd like to build that into the polling question so that we start to get a sense for what are the, you know, what is the community wanting to fund? And our program committees by the end of this year, be presenting to our board, their list of recommendations, you know, here's what we've heard from the community about climate priorities. And here's what our recommendations are in terms of how that should be spent. So thank you for saying it much more eloquently than I have been. So um, that's right on. All right, any other questions in the room? And if not, I'll go to the, the Zoom. I had one quick, quick question about the questionnaire development process. Will some draft questions come before this group or through before the, the workshop groups? What will be the process of reviewing the questionnaire draft questions? For the poll? For the poll. It's actually coming to our board in May for an initial discussion, and then the board will be reviewing and approving the final in June. So that will be, and this group doesn't have a meeting before then. So okay. we'll be coming back to this group. So, so if we want to pay attention to that process, we should monitor the uh, SCTA, yeah. RCPA board meeting yeah. agendas. Yeah. Thank you very much. Tanya, I want to talk. <laughs> we are going Tanya. to do.
a few informal polling type questions as part of our workshop next week. Excellent. That's separate from the actual polling we're talking about. So we're using those two terms, polling, both right now. We're going to do some informal questions next week at the workshop. At the, the workshop, and then I think the specific polls is really through the board. Thank you for the clarification, BC. Thanks. All right, David. Uh, just a question: the, the the public input will be uh, at least one factor in in identifying and maybe ranking projects. Uh, are there are there other factors? Because I can think of you know a number off the top of my head that would. You know, funding funding sources, uh, maybe outside of you know, local funding sources, feasibility. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, other other factors like that that would that would come into play. I mean, something may score very high, but not be very doable for for one reason or another. So, how is 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 there some overarching thought process on all of the you know the the long list of ideas that are, mm -hmm. that are in the agenda? Uh, yeah, we we. To help we with that? Definitely plan and BC's put some good thought into like criteria, you know, how would we evaluate these and that's what we envision our program committees using to make their final recommendations. So it could be things like feasibility, magnitude of cost, impact from a GHG or a you know natural system standpoint. And then as part of the measure itself, similar to what was done in the Go Sonoma measure, there will likely be criteria for any projects that get actually approved for funding. But that that would be once the measures. I have a quick question, Tanya. Sorry, hang on so one second. Um, so I am going to go to Zoom, but I see that Ty has had her hand up for quite a while. So if it's okay, I'll okay. go to Zoom, I'll come back to the room. Um, so Ty and then Kevin are the two that I see so far. Okay, thanks. I'm on the transportation committee with Eris and Alexa. And so my question, the airport tax, can that be suggested by SCTA if it can't be suggested by RCPA that's one question the second question is in response to what Tom said and there is a way to get an initiative on the ballot that you don't have to have a two-thirds majority there's the initiative process where it's only 51 percent could you also comment on that as a possibility thanks so the airport fee or tax is something that we don't have jurisdiction um, that would be the County Board of Supervisors that would have to have to um, authorize that. And um, your second question, sorry, Ty, was about, oh, the- Tom made the point that it's a two thirds, which is gonna be really hard to get a two thirds pass, but you yeah. can do it in a different way where there is just 51% required. Is that, that's my understanding, but I just- That is correct. Um, the concern that has been raised about that is that there's, I don't know if it's actually qualified for the ballot or is likely to be on the ballot in 2024, a measure that would uh, basically disallow that as an option so that any of these types of citizen you know, initiative um, would also need two thirds to pass. And that, as I understand it, it's being written such that if it passes in 2024, anything else that was on the ballot that, you know, any initiatives that passed at that point would be disallowed. And so there would be a great risk to any group in Sonoma County that wanted to do an, initi an initiative, that if that other initiative passed, all of their work would be for naught if they didn't get a two thirds majority in that election. So I think that's a factor to be considered as, but I definitely, it would definitely be easier to pass with a simple majority versus a two thirds, but that may not be, um, there may be a lot of risk in that. So and that evidently is qualified for the ball. ballot that will be on the ballot yeah. next year. Yeah. So that, that's a risky approach at this point. Thank right. you. Kevin. Yep, Kevin. Yes, thank you. Um, with all of uh, how <laughs> we know that the tax initiatives are never popular and then the two thirds majority uh, barrier is also very hard to meet. I'm just wondering if there's any thought being given or, or understanding about uh, grant writing for money. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's that's something that I know I'm paying attention to or other um, staff and other jurisdictions are paying attention to that the challenge. Well, there's a couple of thoughts there. One, many grants require a local match. So depending on the grant source, it's 10 percent, it's 50 percent. So you've got to have some of that money to match the grant. Um, and also grants aren't ongoing funding. So if we need to staff, say, in local jurisdictions, a another code compliance 
um, staff person to make sure that all of these regulations that are going in to you know, prohibit gas appliances or whatever that might be, that we have the, the local capacity to actually enforce those regulations. So um, you know, if we don't have a stable source of funding, we can't fill those types of positions or have those types of programs that need ongoing funding. So that's the, the reason or one reason for bringing in some additional revenue, but definitely grant funding is something that we're watching and you know, going after all the time. Um, not that we couldn't do more of that. Good. But it's Thank you. We follow up on yeah. that. All right. Any other Thank questions? Thank you, Tanya. I'll be in yep. touch with you personally. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, Steve, you had a question? Um, yeah. That is, there's a long list of <clears throat> potential funding sources, and I, I'm hoping to find out a little more information about why some are on or off the board. So it gets down to kind of legal authority of what is essentially a brand new thing for the state. And this climate resiliency district will probably be the first. So how are we ruling things in and out? What is the governing legal yeah. authority? So it, it's actually, we have um, county council who advises both SCTA and RCPA and you know has basically read the legislation and looked at what RCPA is authorized to do as part of that legislation. And this is the legal interpretation of that. So I don't think there's any more that needs to be done to identify, to say, is there anything else on this list we have authority for? It's, you know, this is basically- Is there, is there a county council's memorandum? In this uh, not formally, but we certainly could, yeah. It would seem that, advisable yeah. to yeah. get something in writing from county council yeah. on what yeah. can, can't do. Because originally our CPA didn't have that, anything, so. yeah, any authority. Yeah. But yeah. So remember we do have some now. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? If not, I'd like to just. Well, and, and I would just append to Jake's good idea that we should get something in writing to also clarify whether the Board of Supervisors has that authority, whether um, other jurisdictions have the authorities for some of the things that have been discussed. Yeah. That makes sense that we look yeah. at. Yeah. Because if, if we if we limit it to just SC just our CPA, we lose that leave out SCTA, as I understand it. And if we leave it limited to SCTA, RCPA, we leave out the Board of Supervisors, which there's I think because it's a local countywide initiative that we're mm -hmm. trying to do here, we shouldn't have a tech limit our scope based on a technicality of what agency is the one bringing it forward. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, all jurisdictions could pursue, you know, people could choose to pursue the different options. It's just, we're looking at it through the lens of what does our CPA have the authority to do? Yeah. So, um, all right. I know that we are running very short on time. So, I'd like to just go yes. through the rest of these and give our everybody a chance to give updates on their jurisdictions. Um, so, this is high level timeline of what we're working towards in 2024. Um, and Ross just asked that I remind everyone, you know, you're I know some of you have been active on committees. Uh, anyone is welcome to or participate in one or more of the committees. Um, and we have an online interest form, or you can just email a member of staff and we'll get you connected with that committee. Um, we do have the virtual workshop coming up next Wednesday. And I think I already mentioned, we have Congressman Jared Huffman, uh, who will uh, open the event with some uh, remarks. And it'll be 100% on Zoom. We decided not to try for a hybrid meeting for this one. And we are doing a uh, live Spanish interpretation in the meeting. And then you all know, hopefully, about other ways to stay informed. Um, yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. BC, is there I, anything else? I'm, yes, Jane. I have a quick question about the 19th. Mm -hmm. uh, that event people need to register for, correct? Yes, it's an RSVP yeah, to get the Zoom link. Yeah, thank you. Is that totally Zoom? Yeah, it's a, it's hundred percent Zoom. Yeah, yeah. We talked about doing hybrid and decided for this one we yeah. just do Zoom. It's it turns out it's a bit easier on the translation side. So, um, do you see anything you'd want to? Add? Um, I know I think we have the, the project in, list. In the but... interest of time, I will kind of keep this update very, very brief. Um, just I've been uh, helping to support two of the program committees and working with Dana um, on our SCTA staff, really on the helping to also on the transportation committee. It's really been an interesting process. The committees have been um, basically a process of brainstorming dozens of different ideas of things that could be done by any number of different actors at any number of different levels 
you know, just brainstorming. And then we've been slowly working to group those into some coherent blocks. So within the buildings category, what are the different types of things that could be done? And instead of, we, we knew we didn't want to present back to the board or to anybody a list of here's a hundred things that could be done. So we're like, hey, can we get these into two or three groups? So right now I've been working with each committee to group things into kind of two or three groups per committee. We're then trying to set up, we're feeding that into our presentation for the meeting on the 19th, where we'll kind of present some of that initial, um, those initial ideas, um, ask for some feedback, get some initial rankings. Um, and I think one of the key things that I wanted to make sure we point out kind of at all steps is um, everything right now is a work in progress. None of it is final and none of it is perfect. Um, and there's going to be things on the list that people may look at and go, oh, I really would have worded that differently. I would have done it this way. And that's why, where we are kind of in the process. So um, if we had more time, I was hoping to maybe step through a little bit more of those categories. But in the interest of time, I just kind of want to leave it at that. And um, I think express appreciation to anybody here in the room, anybody on Zoom or anybody who's watching this later, express appreciation to anybody who's participating in that kind of those nitty gritty conversations. Um, the main focus has been on the projects and the programs and how we focus that and not so much on kind of the revenue measure aspects. So that's really been the, the focus of those conversations and um, really interested to be able to kind of show off a little bit of that work next week and get some initial feedbacks as to whether we're heading in the right direction. So um, that I don't know if there's any other kind of specific questions, but I think that's uh, be very interested to get detailed comments from anybody here following next week's meeting. And you kind of have all the materials and then I would really, we'll be doing a further deep dive and kind of re deep dive and a re kind of a reformulation. Hey, are we, are we headed down the right path? So, all right. Thank you, So I think if I'm, if that's my agenda correctly. Uh, next up, we have our report out from CAC members by jurisdiction. So I think what I'll do is I'll just go down my jurisdiction list um, and Cloverdale is at the top. So Jane, any updates from Cloverdale? I think you said when you came in. If anything else came up while, while you were waiting. <laughs> no, I have no update. All right. I, I might have one at the end. Okay. Cool. Not, not one right now. All right. Uh, let's see, Katati, Judith. Yeah, so I talked to my uh, uh, city council member, also happens to be my husband last night. We wrote down <laughs> that was handy. <laughs> so we have uh, three more EV police vehicles on their way. We already have one. Um, the council will also be looking at the electric reach code and the EV ready code soon. And uh, mentioning that all city accounts are now on ever free. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Hildberg, so Ty and or Stephanie, any updates that you'd like to share? Um, I'll go first. So we are very excited to invite you all to our Climate Fest, our first annual Climate Fest, which is happening next Saturday on the Hildberg Plaza from one to four. This has been a huge effort from a lot of the activism uh, activists in our community um, partnering with the city. Um, and Ty's gonna talk about that after my comment. It's gonna be a great event, um, family friendly, English and Spanish friendly with a lot of interactive booths and music and speakers. And um, we've been working really hard on it. So come to Climate Fest. Um, other things that we citizens have been working on um, is that we are preparing for our smart train to arrive in Healdsburg. So we're, um, kind of all a buzz about how that's gonna happen. And a lot of people are um, are communicating. We had a great presentation from the um, general manager of Smart Train a couple of weeks ago with our transportation group. And we're also really looking forward to the updated pedestrian bicycle master plan, which I know comes down from SCTA. And I hear, because I'm always a person asking questions, that there's been a, a consultant hired, but I don't know anything about the consultant process or anything like that. So it would be great to have an update on, on that when that is available for us because we all have lots of comments as people who walk and bike the streets all the time um and then one other quick thing that i wanted to say is that um my 
climate group that I'm a part of that's mostly Healdsburg, but it's kind of all over the place. We've decided to take a pledge in the week leading up to Earth Week, Earth Day, which is a buy nothing pledge. So if anyone wants to join and not buying anything in the week leading up to Earth Day, it's uh, going to be a fun challenge. Ty. Yeah, um, thanks, Stephanie. And we really are excited about this fest and we're grateful that RCPA is participating as their own booth. The city is in the process of you know, working with their consultants to develop the climate mobilization strategy, which is what we pushed on last year. And it really has been positive working with city staff. We feel a real shift happening in Healdsburg. So we're very encouraged. Um, and again, please come one to four next Saturday. Thank you. All right, Petaluma. Petaluma. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> last night there was a climate action commission meeting. Um, Peacock made a presentation. Uh, the chair of the commission uh, made a pre presentation on the final report of the AIA SDAT effort, Sustainable mm -hmm. Design Assessment Team, which was in Petaluma last August. They delivered their final report in November. And we, as part of the local Team that brought them to Petaluma are now working to make sure that that all of the recommendations in the final report don't just die, but the reports seem to. Um, and so there's some wonderful, big, bold proposals in, in the SDAT report. Um, and it's just so clear to me that, that we need some big, bold Proposals, not just little tweaks to the status quo. Um, uh, also, there was a lot of discussion at last night's meeting about synthetic turf, and uh, our climate action commission um, voted unanimously to do everything within their to make recommendations to the city council to phase out synthetic turf citywide. Um, the other effort that I well, two other things I wanted to mention quickly because I've been putting more of my energies into the active transportation complete streets rail, um, both for its climate impacts and its health impacts, and building impacts. Um, we engage services of a group called City Thread to come to Petaluma to uh, interview a, a, bit, a large number of stakeholders and make recommendations to us on how to accelerate the build out of our complete and integrated bike and network. So they are now, the city for a team is in the process of doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with local stakeholders, and we're expecting their final recommendations to be delivered in May. And, and just I'll, I'll mention parenthetically that Santa Rosa was was is another city that is also working with city Green. And the last thing I'll, I'll just mention very quickly, um, a group of community members have been looking at refrigeration management in supermarkets. Uh, one of the members of this team uh, previously worked for Whole Foods as their global refrigeration person. And um, we, as a climate, uh, issue we can overlook refrigerants, but they are huge. And and what we're working toward in Paloma is is getting supermarkets over a certain size to report to the city the same kinds of information that they already have to report to the state. So that would be the first step. And and uh, in addition to that. Uh, Petaluma has a very, very active relief program, which is planting trees. Um, it has its on board and, and volunteer. And we had our final planting for the year. And I just want to report out that we planted 700 trees this year. Oh, All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to excuse myself. I've got a, okay. I'm a you, caregiver. Today, okay. So. All right. I'm sorry we didn't get to your update, Jake. Well, there, there's no update. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. 
Um, thank you all. Yep, thank you. Thanks for being here. So let's see, do we have Julie or Shirley still on the Zoom? I don't I think they are not here from Runner Park. Um, how about Santa Rosa, Kevin? Any updates from Santa Rosa that you'd like to share? Uh, not, not really. I have been disappointed. The Climate Action Subcommittee on the City Council is supposed to be meeting the second Wednesday of every month. I know they canceled the March meeting. There, I can't find anything scheduled after that. April, May, and June. Uh, I can't see that Climate Action Subcommittee meeting scheduled. So that's a bit disappointing. Um, let's see. But the other thing I wanted to say was um, the categories that the committees that are, you're looking at and the committees are meeting for, it seems to be a little bit limited to me. I have a strong interest in uh, mobile microgrids, which is something that's really spreading. And in a community like ours, where we are subject to the wildfires, to have a mobile microgrid would make a lot of sense. And I don't know where that concept would fit in, uh, which committee that discussion would fit into. But anyway, uh, that's my, my update. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kevin. Uh, let's see, Sebastopol, they know. Uh, yeah, your show could not is out of town. I hope he, uh, he told you. I didn't. Maybe you. No. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, our climate committee is now meeting once a month. And, uh, so most of the work is happening in the working groups that we have. And I can say a little bit about energy, finance, and transportation. Uh, the energy working group is. Uh, working with transportation on a EV curbside charging idea. Um, the um, transportation group is um, working on the master plan update of bicycle and pedestrian master plan update uh, with the uh, transportation authority here. I think there's a consultant was hired, the board approved the contract. So we're all eager to uh, work on that. Uh, we have a little group with Bike Sebastopol, the local bicycle organization, to come up with ideas how to improve uh, the bicycle environment in Sebastopol. So we have like three uh, regions in the city, and we mark this region, and we identify points that need to be looked at and, and, and improved. Um, we have a little group on metrics, uh, that tries to say, well, what are the important measures that we can collect information on? And one of the issues there has been, uh, how can the metrics that we collect be so detailed that uh, issues of equity can be discussed using the metric? You know, often when you give an average, it doesn't really say anything about the spread of the issue. So we're trying to identify <clears throat> Um, those dimensions of the metrics that um, are, are uh, relevant for a conversation about equity and impact. Uh, so the metric uh, group is kind of a new one. Uh, we're still um, hashing things out. Uh, there's the metrics of the situation, the metrics of the potential impact of certain programs. So for example, uh, the sequestration approach. What is the potential in the county actually do to circumvent in the air through uh, natural means? I haven't seen any numbers yet. And to see whether that's an important uh, plank of the program, I feel we need to get down to uh, numbers. Also, because I think the overall plan of the, the county and the RCBA depend to some extent on um, <clears throat> carbon neutral uh, by introducing extra sequestration, right? So we need to have these numbers up here. Um, and then the other thing is, um, and that is a kind of a follow-up on that conversation. I mean, we're talking about the powers of different uh, jurisdictions to raise money. 
But I think uh, in the light of what Pete earlier said, there, to me, there's kind of a mismatch between the emerging nature of articulation and the careful approach that we are used to with staff and grants and stuff like that. So these two ideas don't really match very well in my opinion. So we, start, we need to start looking at what are non-financing powers of local authorities to great change and not necessarily wait for a program that costs this and that. There must be ideas that can shift the, the awareness of the population about this issue that are not a program or don't require much staff. Uh, and I would like to see more attention paid to that aspect. All right, thank you. Uh, Sonoma. So city or county first? Um, you could be either one. Um, I'll, I'll go, and uh, but I'm not going to speak about Sonoma. Tom is much closer to what's happening uh, in Sonoma at the moment. Uh, I described him as being at the tip of the spear earlier this morning. <laughs> I don't think he'll talk to that. Okay. So I'm going to talk about something else. I've been doing a lot of work um, at the Sea Ranch with the homeowners association there um, uh, to a less lesser extent with the community. Um, we developed a greenhouse gas inventory similar to what we've done for the city of, of Sonoma uh, and identified uh, a number of opportunities for reducing greenhouse gas generation, fossil fuel use. Uh, the two most exciting of those were uh, using uh, heat pumps to displace the use of propane to heat pools. So sea Ranch has three recreation centers, each of which have pools, and two of them are quite large pools. And, and they heat them all year round, uh, all day long. Um, so that was one opportunity. The other was to uh, move, continue to move the, 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 the association's vehicle fleet to electric vehicles. They have a couple of boats already that are, that are in use for uh, design review type of activities. Uh, our proposal was to, um, uh, to to move that effort into their security fleet. Um, and we've been successful in that. Uh, they had uh, one vehicle that uh, was coming up uh, at end of lease and another one that got crushed by a tree in the storms in January. So they had a, a need and, and, and we took the opportunity to make some recommendations to them. Uh, using their specifications, and it looks like they'll be moving ahead with with uh, two recent two um, two EVs for their security fleet. Mm -hmm. And we're also making progress on that e pump idea, and talking with vendors and and uh, um, and kind of pinning down what the what not what the opportunity is. We feel like we have a, a good handle on the carbon savings, but it's really on the economics of this and making the case that the payback. Uh, would would be attractive because when you're dealing with, I know I think all of us dealing with municipalities, but also with homeowners association uh, associations, it's pretty much got to pencil out, or it's not going to be uh, very attractive to the group. So that's, uh, that's great. Thank you. Oh. Well, city of Sonoma, you may have heard rumors that the city of Sonoma was acephalous and without any political leadership, or we're not quite. We haven't been quite as bad as Haiti in terms of failed state status, but I'm here to dispel those rumors. Um, we we have new city council energy. We formed new, new members. We have uh, I've, I've heard rumor that we have recently hired a new city manager that may be public today or something, yeah. and. Um, that we are starting to move forward. We formed the Climate Action Commission in the city limits and have five uh, adult members of the public, a youth representative and an alternate uh, representative. We've met two times. We'll be meeting, I think, four times throughout the year. And just this week, we We've been busy as in working groups. We formed five ad hoc committees uh, to look into various aspects of climate action the city could take. Buildings, transportation, uh, carbon sequestration and water, solid waste, 
uh, and government operations and municipal implementation. I served on a couple of those and uh, pleased to be able to report out that we, at our meeting this week, approved recommended measures. This is the first time that any of the city commissions have been authorized to make a budget request of the city council in city history, at least recent city history. And so we requested from those five ad hoc groups after deliberations, approximately $231,000 in climate investments. Now that may be more than we can ask of our city council to fund, but we provided them with a great deal of detailed data and our own ranking criteria in making these recommendations. Uh, included in the transportation uh, were uh, bans on new gas stations, and drive-through windows. And we also recommended a moratorium on city fleet purchases until we can complete an EV electrification plan for the fleets. Um, we, also in, we, we also have a $3,500 community outreach and engagement, modest budget, and uh, other details that I can, uh, rainwater capture, tree planting, uh, oh, and importantly, in transportation, we had uh, the city staff had identified the need of a $75,000, what was at the time, a long-term plan for bicycle and pedestrian planning. But we realized that that was old information and that, in fact, the county is, as Healdsburg has said and others have said, participating in a master plan updates. And so the city, we've confirmed the city will be able to dovetail on that and overhaul our bike ped plan and we may have to kick in a little bit of extra money for side, sidewalk gap closure but we're moving forward on all these fronts in the city of sonoma so i'm very pleased to be able to report that thank you great right. so Tom, can i add one thing or ask you a question um the climate action plan that the that the city has was, was that adopted by the city council we are still with a fourth draft stage of this plan but we decided rather than worry about the document itself, that we would move directly into budget request. And then we will come back at our next meeting to discuss two items. Uh, one will be something we call, it has yet to be defined, but what the future of a climate smart tourism might be in Sonoma Valley. And the second thing would be to finalize that climate action, staff drafted climate action. So we, we've already reached out to, to our local visitors bureau and the uh, chamber of commerce for obviously for input into the climate smart tourism discussion, which goes nowhere without their support. Thank you. So I know uh, our Petaluma contingent needs to catch a smart train. Um, so if you all need to leave, please feel free. But I would like to give Christopher and Windsor a chance to give an update. Um, but again, Pete and Beverly, if you need to, I don't want you to miss your train. So Christopher, I'll turn it over to you for an update. All right, I'll be quick. So I won't be offended if anyone gets up. Um, so town of Windsor, um, I got a nice report from Catherine Gabor, our, um, sustainability coordinator. And, um, there's several things going on, including, um, a grant that she just applied for that she feels fairly, um, uh, positive about, um, funding, um, working with neighborhood groups and developing, community really resilient centers, um, examining microgrid deployment and um, updating some more of the plan um, that Windsor's government operations GHD um, study is in draft form now and being reviewed um, and that they're in conversation about the developing the town's EV fleet and EV charging strategy, both of which are, you know, been long uh, standing. Um, we did, it looks like we're losing Michelle, the other town of Windsor, the AAC rep. Um, I don't know what's happening with our city council. I have not received replies to my last few emails and requests. Usually a week or so before these meetings, I email them and ask like, oh, any updates, thoughts, whatever. And I with the current round of our council, I have not been getting uh, much feedback, which is a little bit concerning. So I don't know if they're just leaving it to Catherine or 
I'm not sure what's up. It's hard to speculate. So um, I don't have anything else at the moment. Just um, I'll echo some of the comments before that. Uh, hopeful that uh, being able to do this on Zoom will continue. There's obvious uh, greenhouse gas um, impacts, concerns, and then just uh, it's very hard for working and uh, caregiving people to make it down. So yeah, just underlining that point. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. So I think that covered all of our jurisdictions. Um, we had a couple other items on our agenda, but in the interest of our time, uh, we, the RCPA, RCPA update on activities. Did we have the activities report in the board packet, Drew? If not, we can send you all a link to the report that was given to the board on Monday. So I think we'll skip um, going through that if that's okay with the group. Um, and then I'll ask if there's any quick announcements that would like to make before we wrap up for the day. I don't, let's see, I see Christopher, you have an announcement? No, I, sorry, I forgot to ask. You, oh. BC mentioned the April 19th and I looked through the various things and I, I missed a notification or a link or whatnot to the April 19th event and would love to have that if possible. You just drop it in the chat or something. Okay, yeah, or we'll, maybe we'll just email it to the whole committee so everybody has that fresh on their list. Great, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, any other announcements, folks? Uh, just that the Climate Action um, Committee at the JC is holding their Climate Action Night on April 20th. And that's always a, a really interesting thing where the young people table and get to learn what the different projects are that these young people are into. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Kevin. That's, that's a great event. So one yep. other thing, mm -hmm. someone passed around the North Bay Home Electrification Incentives. Great stuff. This is yep. really, really helpful. And with your permission, I'll share this widely. Yeah, if I get your email, I, you, I can also send a PDF for okay. you, too. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, I wonder if the whole committee would probably be interested. Do you think you could send it? Yeah, I can send it yeah, out to you. Distribute it yeah. I just, just to clarify, the two right-hand columns won't be available until the start of next year, I think. Uh, tax credits right. will apply, though. Yeah. Ah, thank you. All right. So if there's no other announcements, um, we will go ahead and adjourn our meeting for today. Thank you all for being here on Zoom and in person. And uh, we'll see you again in July. It's our next meeting. So, and hope to see all of you on Zoom on the 19th, next great. Wednesday. It's going be great to see you there. Charlie, it's about a complete conclusion. Can we take a pause? Yeah, I'm going to take a pause. Yeah, I don't know.